Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemiroff, and welcome back to Collider Best of the Week, the place to go if you don't have enough time to watch all the shows that go up on the Collider Video's YouTube channel or to read all the articles that go up on Collider.com and you want some of the best of the best right in one nice, neat little place. That's right here. We're going to roll into our first segment, which as always is Movie Talk. As you probably know, there was a Justice League set visit in London recently, and there was so much information that came out of it. I'd love to cover it all right here, but if that was the case, the show would be hours long. So we're going to roll into a brief discussion that the panel had on Movie Talk about whether or not this thing was damage control and why that might be a good thing. They knew that the, the voices of the community, the majority of the voices, whether it's the blogs or the reviews, the voices of the community did not respond to this movie. So they invited those people to say, look at what we're doing yeah. new here. And we're gonna let you talk about it a lot earlier than most, than any set visit 17 does. 17 months. Any set right. visit does. They're letting you see it that early because they wanna get, this is what they want to happen. What we're doing right here, talking about it, getting the word out that this is a switch. Right. Because it's 17 months that we have this time to really get used to it, this is the seed because now we're all going to start talking about it. And now whether or not you're commenting right now that you hate the idea that they're changing the tone or that you love the idea and you're excited how it's going to go, you're talking about it. And it's back in the news again. And Justice League is going to get that kind of uh, ferocity. You're going to you're going to be so excited to see it again. It's interesting because when I was walking out of Batman v Superman, there was a lot of thoughts going in my head. But one of them was I still really want to see Justice League. Like I'm still excited to see this, and that hasn't changed. Christian brings up the point that Devin Faraci made where he was very. Critical of Batman versus mm -hmm. Superman. That's one of the reasons why he got invited to check out this set. Is they said, "Hey, we know you didn't like the, pro the what we just released. Come check out what we're doing now." Schnepp, is there a risk that they're listening too much to the fans and not enough as to what the creative brain trust that has already been shaping the DCU? I think it was very important to, to listen to not just fans but also critics. So it was an overwhelming amount of people saying this didn't hit it the way we wanted it to. And after hearing the, all the different reviews from this set visit, the tone of what the scenes that they saw, c certain sequences and what the concepts are and the, the way that they're approaching this movie, especially Ben Affleck's approach, like, hey, look, we're, I already, he basically said, look, you know, I'm gonna do a Batman movie, but I wanna make sure the script is right because we've already gone down that road when the script wasn't right and you saw what happened. He's directly referring to Batman v Superman in that one quote. So. You know, I think it's a, it's a good sign to, to see that uh, Zach and Deborah Snyder are also willing to take a hit and say, look, you know what? We had this vision. It didn't really go down the way we wanted it to with a, the mass amount of fans. There's a percentage of people who love the film, but not enough to even get it to the, the hit that they want it to be. So they have to course correct. And I think it's good that Zach sees that. So I think that'll come through. We're gonna stick with the Justice League set visit coverage for the hero segment this week. That's where Steve Weintraub came on the show. He's the one that got to go to London for the actual set visit. So he spoke all about his experience there. But for this particular segment, we're gonna focus on his thoughts on Ezra Miller as the Flash. For all you purists out there, you might wanna skip this segment because there could be some spoilers that you don't wanna hear. There's also a BVS spoiler in here as well. So if you don't wanna hear any of that, go on over to Jedi Council. This scene was very bright, played with levity and humor, different Bruce Wayne, different Ben Affleck playing Bruce. Like he was just happier. Like he has a purpose. He knows I, I and basically Ben talked about and, and everyone talked about how he doesn't feel like he honored Superman in life. And he feels like he has a singular purpose to save this planet, to get a team together that can defend, you know, everyone. And he's going to do it by surrounding himself with the best people. But as I said, there was so much fun in the dialogue and Ezra's playing him with this like, fun, youthful energy and happy to be a superhero and just happy to be there. And it, it's just so different than the last two movies. How does he compare to The Flash on television? Uh, it's different because we also saw the costume and the costume is very, basically Barry is incredibly smart. And from what, from what I understand, at the beginning of the film, he will have broken into NASA and he has 3D printers and he's 3D printing his costume using like space shuttle material to deflect heat so he can run at that mm. you know what i mean so the flash on tv if you look right here you'll see that it's like a skin type skin type costume that the superheroes are using sure. the flash costume is in 170 pieces uh, that and it's all put together uh you know because of the 3d printing uh well the costume designer says it's 170 pieces right so basically it's bulkier 
and it's allowing to the, the heat to deflect off him. He also has these really cool sneakers that have the flash symbol on each side and underneath. And it's like, I'm convinced they'll be released when the movie comes out. Like some, you know, Adidas will release them. Uh, but the costume looked cool, and Ezra's playing him with this really fun, great energy. And everyone loved the way Ezra was playing him. And uh, as I said, it's just, it's a different flash. Another really big story from this past week was all the stuff that Entertainment Weekly revealed about Rogue One. Again, it's a lot of stuff. We can't cover it all right here, but we're going to focus on the portion of Jedi Council where everyone ran through some of their favorite new characters that were introduced. And for the record, I'm obsessed with the Death Troopers. I'm still the most excited about Donnie Yen. I cannot wait to see what he brings to this role. And what I love so much is the fact that we've heard there are not going to be Jedi in this movie. They're not going to be lightsabers. We're not going to focus on that. We're certainly in the Force, yeah. which is great. Which I, but that's what I'm saying is yeah. what I like so much is that the more in-depth into the Star Wars lore that we get, the more we're seeing characters that are in tune with the Force but aren't Jedi, where it's like I love getting to see even more of that, to see how people tap into it who maybe aren't trained. Right. So that's the most interesting character to me because we've heard so much about it, um, and now we're finally going to get to see a character on the big screen who kind of plays in that realm. Well, what I did find, I was watched the uh, the Star Wars show on, on YouTube, on the Star Wars channel, and they had Pablo Hidalgo on who talked a little bit more about Saw Guerrera, and what I didn't know about him was that George Lucas had originally wanted to use him in that TV series, the Underworld series. Right. They were going to use. He was going to be like one of the main characters. They took him out and they put him in Clone Wars, and they had him be. He he became this character in Clone Wars that started to. He was very much a part of this rebellion against the Empire, even back then, where he was always this kind of rebelling character. And you see kind of what he's done. He's been mentioned in Bloodline. He's been mentioned in Rebels. It made a lot of sense. I love when they make you people happy, and by you people, <laughs> I mean the completists who know everything about Ken. And it's like, oh, sweet, this really knows. It shows that they're caring about the fans. And speaking of caring about the hardcore fans. Nobody does that better than Mr. Pablo Hidalgo. Go back and watch some of the episodes that that Saw Gerrera's on. It's it's some of the it, that's the one thing I think everybody can agree on is that the Clone Wars was able to go into more adult. You got into more adult themed stuff. There was there were some darker episodes, and Saw Gerrera was in a lot of those. Like there, he he was uh, he, he's on the attack on most of these things. He lost some some people. He was tortured. A lot of stuff happened to him. He's got a vendetta, so and you can see it. It mm -hmm. just you can see it in the in the trailer, and then even in his face, it makes sense that Forrest Whitaker is playing Saw Gerrera. So I never I want Forrest Whitaker to look at me like that. Moving on over to the Collider Nightmare section of the show, we're going to focus on one of this week's Twitter questions that was about jump scares and whether or not they could be effective. I, for one, think they're great when they're done tactfully and creatively, but of course not manipulatively. Let's check out what the panel thought. They are alive and well, if done right, and I believe that they add so much. They're, they're a part of the tool chest that mm -hmm. good horror directors utilize because what it does is it kind of, it brings you down a bit. You get that jump and then you laugh and you release that tension. And then if you're a good director, like many of uh, the people we talk about on this panel, they go right in for the kill. Mm. I think the jump scare ain't going anywhere, and I'm glad it's not. I love a good jump scare. I, I even like the false front jump scare when it's like, oh, it's just a cat, you know? Yeah. Then the next time you get a jump scare, oh. you know it's going to be something real. Criticizing jump scares in horror movies is like a construction worker saying, man, it's really hacky that we use Phillips head screwdrivers. It's like you, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're one of the building blocks of hard. Now, yes, they can be used too much. They can be done in a very cheesy fashion, but when they are, uh, it, when they're conceived properly and you pull them off the right way there's some of the best times you'll ever have in a movie piece. i think jump scares are necessary in horror and it like riley said it's a release mm -hmm. like sure. you're like as you build this tension that oh and it's like hey what are you doing it's just some friend who's like and then you know then they turn and there's the creature but it's through the mirror and only one person saw it so it's a fake jump scare if both people saw it then it's a real jump mm -hmm. scare so there's a whole bunch of different like you said the tools to use whether it's a bucket or a cat or a creaky door or somebody's knocking on the door those are all valid jump scares especially Especially if someone's like, I'm totally looking up the demon's name and ah, what's that? You know, <laughs> it's a crow at the window. Oh, God. then it's behind you. Ah, you know, like the sinister, where it's like, what's wrong? And you see the little demon's face right behind the guy. That got me, yeah. even though it's a corny, weird, like painted demon, scared the hell out of me. So I mean, the, I love them. You know who's yeah. great at jump scares? Nuns. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellis, That's you brought right. up Drag Me to Hell a little earlier, and that one to me is just like uh, it's like being in a in a. Um, carnival funhouse mm. because that's the fun of walking through those old like creaky goofy little things where the, the thing pops up yeah. and you go oh god it's so and then you go oh ha, 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 that's so dumb <laughs> 
We've got a bunch of new releases hitting theaters this weekend, but one that might not be on your radar is Gary Ross's latest film, The Free State of Jones. I got the opportunity to sit down with Matthew McConaughey to talk about the film, and we're going to highlight a little piece of my interview during which he talks about one of my favorite sequences in which he stars alongside his Mud co-star, Jacob Laughlin. So I'm a big fan of Mud, so I was very excited to see you on screen with Jacob again. Did you two keep in touch, or was that purely a coincidence? Well, we've kept in touch. We talk every six months. He'll write. Now, Jacob's getting a little older now, right? So Jacob got to stay in a hotel room by himself with that mom there, so he's got a little independence, you know. And uh, um, he's growing up well, though. Takes the craft very seriously, was very professional, um, all about the work. He's really, because it's great to see him again because he was much more raw the first time we worked together in mud. Um, but he's becoming a fine little actor. His sequence in this, oof. One heck of a way to start this and that's, film. That's one take, Jacob. That's, that's one take. We did a couple, but he didn't one need more than one. One take as in from what point to what point? In all of his takes. <sighs> you did maybe two or three for the fun of it, but it was like Gary and I were like, he had it. He did it every time. He showed up prepared, ready, nailed it. In addition to junket coverage, we also do some red carpet coverage as well. And this week, Steve was on the red carpet along with Frank, one of our Collider News Editors, for the Saturn Awards. And that's where he got the opportunity to catch up with Star Trek showrunner Brian Fuller. Let's check out a clip from that interview. I'm assuming this is going to be one story over 13 episodes. Yes. Not going to change for the That's the thing that excites me so much. Oh, good, good. Me too. Because I'm imagining even CBS is saying, we well, need something that can stream 13 episodes. And, you know, there are 762 episodes of Star Trek television, over six episodes, so we have to tell stories differently than, than they've been told for 50 years. I, I, I don't want to pressure you into talking too much about the specifics, but I've heard it maybe doesn't take place on the bridge as much as another part of the ship. Oh, um, I hope not because our bridge design is awesome. <laughs> okay, well, maybe I'm wrong about that. When are you going to start revealing the specifics of where the timeline is and that kind of stuff? I imagine around Comic Con. You know, there's. It's interesting because I, normally I love talking about everything, and I'm I'm sort. I'm sort of relieved in a way that I've been muzzled by CBS on it because I, I, I do less interviews, you know, so I can spend more time writing. Uh, because, but you know, I love talking about Star Trek and I love being involved in it. So I'll be very excited to share when the muzzle comes off of me. Last week on TV Talk, the group shared their opinions on Superman joining the Supergirl TV show. This week, that role was cast, and it's Tyler Hoechlin in the role. Let's check out what the TV Talk panel thought about that one. I mean, the dude's good looking enough. He's got the jawline for Clark Kent. He's got the hairline for Clark Kent. He uh, seems to have the eyes of a Superman. Mm -hmm. I don't watch Teen Wolf because I'm not 14 and a woman. Uh, so I never really like saw saw that show, but I loved him in Everybody Wants Some. And I was like... Well, what about Road to Perdition? Did you watch him in Road to Perdition? He was, he the, was kid. the kid. And, yeah, but that was like... I mean, being a 12-year-old and acting is one thing. Being Superman is a totally other. And to carry, in what I thought was going to be an amazing movie and everybody wants some, was, it was good. And he was definitely a highlight of that movie, for sure. Um, we talked about, like, Matt Bomber. And obviously, we talked about Matt uh, Tom Welling uh, about it. I'm glad that they picked a dude that, that looks like Superman, but isn't exactly you know, like a name on the board, you know what I mean? Like some name guy because I little, you know, introduce him to the CW world. Also, he's extremely good looking, so obviously <laughs> the CW knows what they're doing. So, D. Griff, what do they you know, think? They know how to pick the good looking they ones. Do. I was rooting for Matt Bomber, but this guy, I mean, you know, he could be a future star. He's yeah. doing the next two Fifty Shades movies. Yeah. He's set up, man. He's and big time. From Road to Perdition, Sasha, to Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah. to Superman. In all his interviews, he's got a little bit of chest hair popping out. He's one of my my hairy brothers oh, nice. in arms. You know? I know well, that, 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 that chest Jet going to be gone. Oh, yeah, it's gone. Gonna shake. No, it's gone. Here's the thing. I feel like sometimes I watch movies and I'm like, oh man, I love this person. Like, for example, I love mm. Charlie Hunnam. I loved Sons of Anarchy. But I watch him in Pacific Rim and I'm like, oh man, you're a TV star. Yeah. I look at Alexander Skarsgård. I loved him on True Blood. I see him in Tarzan and I'm like, dude, you're a TV star. Yeah. Mm. This kid. He's got abs though. I see Taylor Hawkland doing a CW show and I'm like dude you're a movie star mm. and if this is the thing that propels him to the next level I can't wait he was great on Teen Wolf I mean the show did you watch Teen Wolf I didn't watch all of it I watched the first season and I liked everybody kind of, wants some I thought he was he plays yeah. a good jock he was yeah, fantastic jock, yeah. in that I think that this is great casting it will definitely have me tuning in mm. and I think it's awesome now it's time to move over to the collider.com portion of the show when we get to highlight some written features done by the team over there 
Odds are, if you're watching the show, you are well aware that we have a ton of content up on the site from Steve's Justice League set visit. There is so much material and it's all well worth sorting through, but if you want all the key details in one place, check out Steve's main set visit article. We also had another set visit report go up this week about Aubrey Page's visit to the set of Bad Moms. If you've seen the trailer for that one, you know that there's a pretty amusing and very messy scene that takes place in a grocery store, and that's exactly what Aubrey got to see them shoot. This week, the 2016 Licensing Expo took place in Las Vegas, where tons of new material for big upcoming releases was on display. Steve was there for the event and took a whole bunch of pictures, so go to Collider.com to check out all of his photos, which covers things like the new DC film logos and props and costumes from Wonder Woman. This next one is one heck of a piece from Dave Trumbor. In honor of the Fast and Furious franchise's 15th anniversary, Dave created a character guide and recapped what every single main character went through film by film. As one might expect, it's a long write-up, but if you need a series refresher, this is a great place to go. With Game of Thrones Season 6 wrapping up on Sunday, it's the perfect time to check in on our interactive Game of Thrones recap map, our collaboration with the folks at MapMe. It details what went down in the most recent episode, but if you've forgotten where things left off after no one, this could get you back up to speed for the finale on Sunday. On this week's Schmodown, we've got Sam Levine facing off against Jeff Snyder. It's a big match. The winner goes up against Clark Wolf. It featured some incredibly nice shit talk from one of our contenders and a particularly low blow from another. So let's get a preview of that one. Jeff is a real beast in this competition. I watched his earlier match, and the guy clearly knows his stuff. Uh, I think it's really going to come down to luck. Listen, I grew up watching Sam Levine, okay? Uh, big fan of him as an actor. He's terrific. As far as movie trivia goes, he hasn't proven anything to me, okay? You know why Freaks and Geeks here got canceled after one season? Because it was miscast. Sam Levine wasn't a freak or a geek. He was a loser, baby. He's a real worthy competitor. He knows his stuff. And I'll try not to hold the fact that he's from Boston against him. But I will hold it against him. Ladies and gentlemen, we give to you the Insnider Chef Snyder. Sunglasses on his shoulder, right his shoulder, a very casual bother. look for Jeff Snyder. And he is the inglorious one, Sam Levine! And the crowd goes wild, Sam Christian. Levine. In 1991, Disney's Beauty and the Beast became the first animated feature film to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. What film did it lose to? Sounds the Lance. That's correct. Of the 10 Best Picture winners from the 2000s, that's 2000 to 2009, we need two of the Best Picture winners in that time frame. Chicago and Slumdog Millionaire. You know, the guy doesn't blink, and uh, he got that question right. Beast. Now it's time for Meme of the Week, the time of the show where we get to highlight some super cool memes and artwork you guys made that's inspired by some of our shows here. As you guys know, we love the shit rats, except maybe for Mark Ellis. So we get a lot of shit rats art over here, but we got one especially cool poster that came in and we want to share it with you. Thank you so much to Bruno Rodak for sending in this absolutely incredible detailed shit rats poster. We absolutely adore it. Do you want your meme or artwork featured on Best of the Week? Pick a favorite moment from one of our shows, send in some art to mailbag at collider.com or tweet it at us using the hashtag Collider Best of the Week. We'll check it out and then we're gonna pick a winner for next week. It's the time you've all been waiting for. It's blooper time. And I don't think we're gonna see any of Josh McCougar on the show, no? What? <laughs> Wait, what? Come on, I've been this begging guy. to meet. Look guys, come on, I just, bloopers, they're my favorite. Welcome back. Here we go. I'm very particular with my rabbit and turtle. <laughs> it's like, hey, what'd you eat there? Don't worry about it, I got here. <laughs> of what we can expect from our favorite bunch of a-holes. Oh. Wait, what? That's a normal thing to say. I hope someone overheard that. Come I can't on. get down with that Fifty Shades stuff because it's just so not sexy. Like, I feel like if you watch that movie and you're like, ooh, you, you, your life is so sad. Your sex life is so sad. David. Oh, D, D. Griff, are I you? Liked, I, I read the Sorry, first book. Sorry, Miss Griffin. We just sat on a little Cody, something about your son. Cody, blooper part. Yeah, put that <laughs> in the time code. Okay? Oh, hey. <laughs> it's Tony Ravioli. Hey, Tony hey, Ravioli. Tony Ravioli. Tony Ravioli, Ravioli, Ravioli and his friend Joey Peppers. What are you going right. to do? Tony Ravioli. Oh, Stromboli, come on. Hey, James Bond could eat a Sicilian slice. Get off. What are you going to do? Cheerio, cheerio. 
Am I saying shit weird? Chariot, cheerio, shit cha cha. Dio. Dio! That's my move! Wait, am I saying shit weird? Forced outing rough and tumble protector. Forced outing rough and tough. Tom Rothman, the chairman of Sony Pictures Entertainment's Motion Picture Group. Sorry. Tom Rothman, the chairman of Sony Pictures Entertainment's Motion Picture Group. Tom Rothman, the chairman of Sony Pictures Sony Pictures Entertainment's Motion Picture Group. Tom Rothman, the chairman of Sony Pictures Entertainment. Yes. So we're gonna keep this nice and tight and just, that's awkward. People are gonna say nasty things about that. I can't do it with this one, I don't think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until he does it. Really, really Cranston. <laughs> He's Johnson. <laughs> Tommy Cruz. Tommy Cruz. Tommy Cruz. Yeah, well, um, well, um, well. <laughs> what? Peppers. Hey, Tony Pepper's gonna be here. Tony Ravioli. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna be getting some specific details on the actors that will bring the new seat? 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 Boo! Sha! Baka! Laka! Buku! Ba! David would obviously be high on vinyl all the time, but we could all whatever. I like that high on vinyl. High on See? <laughs> How old vinyl? Um, it's a deer! <laughs> it's a deer! It's a deer! Along with the blockbuster lineups, Warner. <laughs> <laughs> In my entire life, never heard somebody under our part like that. <laughs> that he is on HBO. Sasha's about to lose what? it right now. Oh my goodness. What happened? Um, what's going on? What? Legends of Tomorrow sophomore season premieres Thursday, October 13th. <laughs> I, got it up. I, was like, I was like, did you want to be in this shot? And Riz Ahmed as Body. A hot headed, what is his name? Body. Period. And Riz Ahmed as Body. The hot headed head. Did I, I said Body again. And Riz Ahmed as Body. You guys, I'm just obsessed with his body. He's so hot headed. Say, like, oh, body. Get the oxygen yeah. mask, everybody. Besides the la la la, la I think I did pretty good. Joining us today is Christian Harla. Yeah, boy. Unfortunately, he is dead and quite flatulent, using the gassy body to his advantage. Hank Miraculous, I knew it was coming. <laughs> No it's kind of called lawns culture. Stuff in. Hey. Come on. That's a wrap on Collider Best of the Week. You guys know what to do. Hit the comment section below and share some of your favorite moments from our shows. I am Perry Nemroff. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P Nemroff. Please go over and bookmark Collider.com. Subscribe to the Collider Videos YouTube channel. Check out all of our shows. Read all of our articles. But if you don't have time for all that, that's what Best of the Week is for. See you next week, everyone. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.